Good evening, friends, enemies, and unacquainted strangers. I welcome you to the Discord Library. I am the curator, and these listless halls house many stories and artworks. This evening, I bring you a story and a flyer from the collections. Static copies of this evening's artwork have been linked in the description box or description card wherever you found our audio recordings. The flyer has no objectionable material. However, the story depicts death, drug abuse, hallucinations, and immolation, so if any of those would cause undue mental strain, please feel free to skip this story and peruse the other artworks the library has to offer. But with that, let's begin. Dr. Crane Graham stood in front of the lecture hall. Elegant, curving ribs of bone met up overhead to form the vast hall. It encompassed the lecture stage as well as the few hundred vacant faces of students that were listening to their lecture. Carcosa, the sunken city, a marvelous place where treasures, art, and secrets of the universe existed, if only one could find Carcosa. It was a beautiful, powerful legend that influenced many cultures throughout history. Crane handed a photo printed on stiff, translucent cartilage to the projection beast. Its bioluminescent organs displayed the image of cave pictographs and temple murals in a sickly blue-green glow across the back wall of the lecture hall. The pictures and murals depicted variations on an underground city of shining domes illuminated by two suns. The surface dwellers were depicted as setting up excavations and searching caves to approach Carcosa. Many cultures told the story and believed it to be a real place, searching for it in the shifting sands. Crane handed the projection beast another card of cartilage and watched the image shift the ruins of a monastery. Some people interpreted Carcosa not as a physical location, but more as a state of being, and that to find Carcosa was to unlock the truths of the universe within oneself. Crane gestured with a long bone pointer towards the crumbling murals that showed a shining city being embedded within the body of a thinking person. Modern research has determined that the legend of Carcosa comes from an ancient myth spread by verbal tradition through trade routes and nomadic peoples. We now know Carcosa to be a lie, but we can still see that some people's belief is enough to lend it some substance and have real impacts on the world. The impacts of this are important to understand, but I have run over time enough already and I can pick up next session. Crane tapped on the projection beast, which happily spat back up the photos and started hopping off to its den at the side of the podium. The great basins of fireworms above were uncovered, from Crane tugging sharply on a slight signal nerve. Soon the vast tiered hall was illuminated with brilliant red-orange light. And remember, your essays are due this evening. Please get them to my office before I leave today. There was a loud, audible sigh of discomfort from several students as all packed and made ready to go. Crane walked over to the lectern and rested their hand on its cold, smooth crown while they took a swig from their water flask and started packing away the photo slides from the lecture. I, you, Professor Graham, have you approved this? Crane slowly turned around to address the voice. That is I. The figure was not one of their students. Sunken and hollow, gray skin on a frame so skeletal it seemed as though the person was held upright by the force of their worn suit binding them together. The figure was holding out a rolled poster. Crane could feel the intense gaze of the figure as they unrolled the soft black vellum rectangle. Crane stole a glance at the figure and could have sworn that the figure's eyes were black flames tipped with gold, threatening to burn away the figure's gray skin. But in another glance, the figure merely had very dark eyes that stared intently at Crane, urging Crane to address the poster. The poster was calling for performers for a play with the tagline, Transcend Your Life, Become Part of the Magic. Crane would have scoffed and thrust it back to the figure, but their intense, unblinking gaze bade Crane to take a closer look at the play. 
The edges of the paper were decorated with elegant gold and red filigrees. There was a strange jackal mask whose eyes burned with the same black flames rimmed with gold. But what most curious and concerning of it all was that interested parties were to contact Professor Crane C. Graham for auditions. No, this is most certainly not me. It must be someone trying to use my name to drum up hubbub, as they know that this is exactly the type of thing I would not endorse. Thank you for bringing this up. I will look into it and put a stop to it. Crane made to roll up the poster and tuck it away before they felt a bony, clamping hand curl around their arm. The figure gripped into them with a vicious ferocity, as though Crane were the last lifeline tossed to a drowning man. The figure drew Crane back around such that Crane had to face the discomfort of looking at the mangled figure. The figure's voice resembled Crane's own, if Crane were trying to speak through a throat filling with blood. Do not put on the play. You will not win. The only way to win is to stop. Now walk away. Do not give it power. As Crane subconsciously leaned in and tried to look anywhere but the figure's intense, unwavering gaze, he noticed the strange figures of the feature, figure with the jagged cut in the lip right where Crane would get theirs after a few dry weeks, the one tooth that was smaller and off-kilter from the others, just as Crane had in their own mouth and even the faded blue pocket square that resembled Crane's own, albeit unraveling with holes around the familiar embroidered initials. The figure choked on their words, with blood pouring out of their open mouth and between their teeth. Soon the figure was melting away into more and more and more blood that was pooling on the floor and seeping into Crane's sleeve. The last remaining portion was the gripping, clutching hand, whose touch lingered in the mind long after the hand itself liquefied and dripped into the fabric of Crane's coat. Crane stumbled back, their one clean arm desperately propping them up against the enamel of the lectern. Crane stared in stunned silence as the blood dripped off their sleeve, but before they could get their wits back and call for help, both their sleeve and the puddle on the floor slowly caught fire with the same black flames tipped with gold as had been in the poster. Brilliant shadows danced around the flames, and soon, like a horrifying candle of blood and black flame, the figure was all but gone, leaving no traces of their existence beyond the searing, tickling pain on Crane's arm and the lingering intensity of empathic Desperate grip. The moments of desperate hollow silence stretched in for an eternity before Crane collapsed behind the lectern, their legs no longer holding them up on the smooth stone floor. When Crane was able to move again, they fumbled in their coat pocket for a small handful of bioluminescent blue capsules of glowing liquid that de they desperately and shakily swallowed with a swig from their water flask. Crane leaned heavily on the door to their office, letting it fly open unexpectedly as they stumbled into the room and collapsed into a large black leather chair behind their desk. The door scurried back into place with some disgruntled chirping as the beastie settled back into its usual grooves, and Crane made some non-committal, exhausted grunts in response. After a little bit of sitting slump in their seat, simply letting the large leather chair prop them up off the floor and not deigning to move, and just trying to get the world to stop, they turned towards the desk by shuffling their feet in an attempt to use as little energy as possible. The stacks of letters and homework in the desk seemed positively insurmountable from their perspective slumped in the chair with an uncomfortable crick in their neck. With a great protest and much swearing, they heaved themselves upright into their chair and gazed at the piles of work. Their hands quivered from the effort and slowly they grabbed an essay from the top of their grading stack and started to read. Punched over the document like a starving man protects his meals, 
Crane read. Every once in a while, Crane would make a note with the pen, a hasty, shaky scrawl mentioning the paper's lack of supporting evidence or awkward phrasing as the tallow candles burned low and the stack of graded but unsatisfactory papers grew. Crane's tremors grew more severe. At times, they would shake their entire arm with violent spasms. Crane's heart pounded in their ears, an incessant pounding that pulsed with the haziness and flickers of the light. At some point, their head dropped to the desk, blowing out the candle and leaving them in the darkness, where the only sound was the subtle scuttling and groaning of the room. Their body took no breaths of sleep, and they did not stir again. That is all I have for now. Thank you, shadowy wanderers of the night, and I hope you have a wonderful evening.